Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by TRX Dinosaurs. They have innovative puppets, poseable sculptures, and they also have animatronics, newly added. <laughs> you can find out more at trxdinosaurs.com. This week, we have an interview with Dr. Alexander Hastings, and we have Dinosaur of the Day, Xenotarsosaurus, and a bunch of dinosaur news. But first, as always, we'd like to thank some of our Stegosaurus patrons. This week, we'd like to thank Kyle, Brendan, the Tolbert family, Sean Tanagaki, Remy Rodriguez, Marcy, Rohan, and Bradley. And Bradley's at our Tyrannosaurus level, but we have now opened up our upper levels to also giving shout-outs, like if you're on our Stegosaurus level. So thank you so much to everybody. We really appreciate you, and if you want to join this growing group on our Patreon page, then check out our page at patreon.com slash inodino. Jumping right into the news, we have a new paper about a new sauropod from Africa, and it was published in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution, and written by Hisham M. Salam and others. It's a titanosaur from the Sahara Desert, and it's named Mansurosaurus shahine, and Mansurosaurus is named after Mansura University, which was where a lot, most of the researchers on the publication were from. Interestingly, Mansoura University is north of Cairo. It's in the Nile River Delta. And this was actually found hundreds of miles southwest, you know, past Cairo and everything, in central Egypt. But I think they have one of the better paleontology programs in the area. And that's how they ended up there. Cool. It was yeah. a big find. Yeah, it really was. So just to catch up on the species name, Shahine, it's for... M. Shaheen for her contributions to the school's paleontology program. So it's a very Mansura University pride dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> they found lots of vertebrae, some ribs, a lot of the shoulder and front limbs, pieces of the hind feet, part of the jaw, and a little bit of the skull, as well as osteoderms, which is quite a bit from a sauropod. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you just get one or two bones. In the paper they said it's, quote, the most completely preserved land-living vertebrate from the post cenomanian Cretaceous, which puts it in that range of 94 to 66 million years ago. So in that whole about 30 million year time period, it's the most complete vertebrate period, meaning any kind of animal that basically is on land, you know, anything with bones, <laughs> essentially of the entire African continent. So that's pretty amazing, especially for such a large animal. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you can find more complete smaller animals because you only need a small area to get preserved nicely. When we interviewed Matt Lamana, he hinted at this dinosaur and how he had a really exciting sauropod <laughs> coming up in Africa. So now we know what it is. And it was estimated to be about 80 million years old. And that's really important because that time period in Africa is a very sparsely populated group. That's how, you know, this ends up being the most completely preserved vertebrate from that time period. There really just aren't a lot of fossils known from that time period. And that time period is also very important because it's right after South America disconnected from Africa and you've got sea levels rising and things like that. So everybody's wondering how these animals are interacting with other continents, if they are at all. What they found was that Mansurosaurus was more closely related to titanosaurs in Southern Europe and East Asia than it was to those in South America, which was pretty surprising to me because Europe at the time was basically a series of islands. So you wouldn't think it'd be easy for dinosaurs to get back and forth between Europe and Africa. And then East Asia obviously is even farther away. But these sauropods at least seem to have managed to do it because they have a lot in common with those sauropods. And even though it had only been 20 million years since South America had disconnected from Africa and they weren't that far apart yet, <laughs> 
it was still far enough, apparently, to prevent these dinosaurs from mixing. It also shows that Africa wasn't completely isolated from other continents in general, which was another hypothesis that possibly they couldn't have made it to Europe or South America, and they were in an isolated, you know, evolving on their own group, like some islands, and then you end up with some weird creatures. But it doesn't look like that was the case at least 80 million years ago. They estimate that Mansurosaurus was about 9 meters or 30 feet long, and it weighed about the same as an adult male African elephant, which is about 5 to 6 tons. It's kind of small for a sauropod. Yeah, I mean, especially for a titanosaur, we always think of those as being these huge things. When you've got AM and H naming things like the titanosaur, and it's enormous, <laughs> but it really... Just like all dinosaurs, there are smaller ones as well as larger ones. And in a BBC article, which was based on a conversation with one of the co-authors, Dr. Gorsick, they wrote, rather than being a piece of a jigsaw filling in the gaps in dinosaur history, it's more like a corner piece, <laughs> <laughs> which I really liked because you hear that analogy a lot about paleontology, how Figuring out what dinosaurs and what the ecosystem is like from these bones is like having one or two pieces of a 500-piece jigsaw puzzle and trying to interpret the rest of the puzzle from that little bit. So apparently this is a little bit better because it's more like a corner piece. Gives you a little bit of context, <laughs> a little more information than you get from just a random piece. And as a side note, they also said in the description that it has a, quote, pronounced ventral projection or chin, end quote. <laughs> which I thought was funny to think about sauropods having a pronounced chin since they have such <laughs> tiny heads. That's true. And it, it must be pronounced relative to other sauropods because looking at the lower jaw that they found preserved, it just looked like a sauropod jaw to me. I couldn't really see much of an extra chin on it. But since I'm not an expert, I don't know. <laughs> and we want to thank Chris via Twitter and Ian via Patreon who sent us articles to this story. It was a big one. Up next, we've got an article from the Proceedings of the Royal Society B by Victoria Arbor and Lindsay Zano. It's similar to the talk we reported about that Victoria presented at last year's SVP, and it also has a lot in common with the interview that we did with her. And the article focuses on the question of why bony tail weaponry is so rare amongst animals. If you look at weaponry for predator defense in general, you see it all over the place. It's really common to want to defend yourself against a predator, not surprisingly. If you look for tail weaponry, it's fairly common. There's a lot of modern animals that do something called thrashing, which is basically just like flailing the tail. Sometimes it's got little spikes or something on it. And lots of modern animals do that, including apparently aardvarks, porcupines, pangolins, lots of lizards, and also alligators. So pretty cool. Maybe pangolins are a really good comparison to ankylosaurs because they're yeah. all armored. And if they're flailing their, their tails too, that's interesting. <laughs> the real issue though is even though tail weaponry is fairly common, bony tail weaponry is very uncommon. And so they analyzed a large group of different amniotes, which include both reptiles and mammals. And what they found is that bony tail weaponry, like that on ankylosaurs, correlates to large body size, meaning larger than 100 kilograms or 200 something pounds, and having body armor already, as well as herbivory. So if you have those three traits, you're big, you're covered in armor, and you're herbivorous, it's likely that you also have bony tail weaponry. And since it's a correlation, it's not a cause and effect sort of thing. So you could maybe have bony tail weaponry and then get body armor or then established herbivory. It's not really predictive, but it does show that you're looking for those three traits if you want to see bony tail weaponry. And it turns out that those three things are a pretty uncommon combination. Although there are at least three types of dinosaurs that did eventually have all those traits and eventually bony tail weaponry. And those are the stegosaurs, the ankylosaurs, and even some sauropods have club tails or little <laughs> kind of bat-like ends of their tails. Like I mentioned, tail flailing is 
much more common in modern animals, but apparently it's more of an escape mechanism than how bony tail weaponry is used. So a lot of these animals will flail the, their tail and then run into a crack or under a tree or into a burrow or something like that. So it's something that you see more in small animals than large animals, which might be why we're not seeing it so much these days, because we don't have big armored herbivores. It's the only one that was around, the glyptodonts. We ate all of them, essentially, <laughs> as humans, <laughs> and then they aren't around anymore. So even if there were more of these around today, it kind of seems like we might have eaten all of them because they're just such a convenient thing to kill and eat. Because they're obviously <laughs> slow, right? They're weighed down by all that armor. They're oh, herbivorous, no. which makes them tasty. And then we can handle the bony tail weapon. You know, nothing <laughs> stops humans from killing animals. So, <laughs> yeah, I think that might be one of the number one reasons why they're not around today. They also mentioned something interesting. Basically, that bony tail weaponry might have evolved because of, quote, iterative selective pressures beginning with passive predator defense or general body armor to active predator deterrence or tail lashing and possibly to conspecific combat tail clubs and flails end quote so they're proposing that one of the ways this might have evolved is basically they got armor to protect against large animals something like an armadillo has and then they started lashing their tails to prevent the predators from getting at them in a more active way and then eventually once they were trying to show off these tail weapons in a way of attracting mates or fighting off others of the same species that's when they became clubs and flails and flails meaning like spiky mace like things so that's kind of a cool idea that the reason they're so intense and awesome looking is exactly for that reason to be awesome looking <laughs> and more impressive and you know possibly better at fighting off peers so we'll have to see if that develops further because that's a new hypothesis i think cool next we have lots of museum and dinosaur show news so first up the natural history museum in london has created a 3d model of dippy the diplodocus's skull and in the article I found, you can rotate and zoom into the skull, and it was laser scanned and then 3D printed. And apparently eight skulls have been printed in preparation for his UK tour, so I guess if you see him on his tour, you can touch his head. That's cool. I wonder if I could print one. It doesn't really sound like it based on that. No, I don't think they release the models or whatever you use Boo. to print. But they might not be allowed to. I kind of wonder how that works, because that's already a replica of one of the the Diplodocus that's in the AM&H, right? Or in Carnegie or some American museum. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if they have the rights to sell <laughs> or freely distribute things like that. It might not have been part of their contract in like 1900 or whenever they got it to, though. I don't know. <laughs> hard to say. How would they have known? <laughs> exactly. Well, you get those contracts in in music contracts now where it's like we have rights to every future type of distribution throughout the universe that's like the legal language they use yeah but that only started maybe 20 years ago yeah i think so <laughs> not in 1900 probably not. here <laughs> so no looking at that article it looks like it's just a thing you can scroll around and zoom in nothing gotcha. there are links but it looks like it's links that explain how they made it this 3d skull not how to print it yourself. Not that I've found. That doesn't mean it's not out there. <laughs> so next, Jurassic World's getting a live arena show, which is pretty exciting. Yeah. So Feld Entertainment Inc. is producing the show, and it's going to be called Jurassic World Live, and it won't go on tour until fall 2019, but there's going to be life-size dinosaurs, and it's going to be dinosaur characters from the movie. So they've got the T-Rex from the movie. They've got Blue, the Velociraptor. There's also uh, going to be a projection mapping, so you can go to Isla Nublar. And no tour dates have been announced yet, but there is a website where you can sign up to get notified when more information comes out. Don't worry, Garrett, I already signed us up. <laughs> That's cool. I hope that it's a lot like... Walking with Dinosaurs? Yeah. Yeah. Because that was one of the best shows I've ever seen. And some of the coolest dinosaur animatronics, too. Mm -hmm. Those are amazing. In Fruta, Colorado, Dinosaur Journey Museum just got a $100,000 grant, which will fund a digitization lab and renovations to the museum's auditorium. And the lab's meant to digitize fossils from the Jurassic so they can be more closely studied. So that'll be really cool. And shared with me? 
<laughs> That's always my question when Not things get digitized. Not just you, but I don't know what the plans are for sharing. <laughs> what does this have to do with me? That's the real question here. <laughs> Anyway, in Idaho Falls, the Museum of Idaho has a new exhibit called Dinosaurs in Motion, where art and science meet. And it's a traveling exhibit that was created by the late artist John Payne. John was from North Carolina. And Garrett, I don't know if you remember, we actually saw that exhibit back in 2013 when we were in North Carolina. I do. (laughs) Yeah, so in that (laughs) exhibit, you can control 14 dinosaurs with these mechanisms. There's a lever and pulley systems. There's video game controllers. I think we prodded a few of them we didn't really know what we were doing back then i remember using the controller it was like you could open and close its mouth and maybe like jiggle it a little bit yeah i remember the le- um the lever pulley it was some kind you really of... needed some muscle to get some yeah. of the stuff moving yeah i had a hard time with that but they were all metal like big metal sculptures yeah they look really cool though. they did <laughs> so if you're in the area the exhibits open until april 22nd yeah, I, I think I'd recommend that one. That was a pretty good one. Mm-hmm. In New York, the Long Island Children's Museum has a new traveling exhibit called Dinosaurs, Land of Fire and Ice. And it was created by the Minnesota Children's Museum, and it shows dinosaurs' habitats, and it also has a dig station. Seems like every children's museum that has dinosaurs has a dig station. They have to have something interactive, because kids just are bouncing off the walls. True. So brush a little sand off those fake bones. <laughs> <laughs> Or throw sand at each other. I don't really know what ends up happening in those. (laughs) (laughs) In Arkansas, the Museum of Discovery will have a new exhibit starting February 3rd called Dinosaurs Fossils Exposed. And the exhibit runs through April and it will allow visitors to touch six dinosaur skeletal molds, including Triceratops, T-Rex, and Velociraptor. There's your interactivity. Cool. Uh, This one's kind of cool. You can now see a dinosaur sculpture at Heathrow Airport at Terminal 5 in London. It's a stainless steel velociraptor, or at least it looks like a velociraptor to me, and it was made by artist Michael Turner. And the sculpture is in a gallery in the terminal, and it's on sale for 45,000 pounds. It's about 12 feet wide and 6 foot 6 inches tall. So it's a little bit more like Utah raptor size then. I mean, a velociraptor wouldn't be 6 feet tall. Oh, I see. Yes. Actually, Jim Kirkland tweeted at us when we first posted about this. He says, nice likeness of the Jurassic Park world Velociraptor, but a poor representation of the feathered reality of Velociraptor or Utah Raptor. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And my response to him was, agreed, but it is shiny. (laughs) It's this shiny silver thing. (laughs) It's important. Stainless steel polishes up real nice. It does. (laughs) In Hillsboro, California, there's this iconic Flintstone house. I'm pretty sure we've talked about this before. It's a house that looks like the Flintstones house on the outside and the inside, which doesn't look that comfortable to me, but it is kind of cool to look at. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, the house sold for $2.8 million last May. Jeez. And early this year, the new owners added some new decor, including some dinosaur sculptures that are made of metal. And it looks like there's a Triceratops and maybe a Spinosaurus, along with they also have a metal mammoth and a metal giraffe. William Nicholson, an architect, built the house back in 1976. You can see it if you're driving on the I-280 freeway. Where's Hillsboro, California? It's not that far from us. Okay, because I was thinking that it sounded like a Bay Area city. And then I was thinking it might have gone for $2.8 million just being a house near the Silicon Valley. You know what I mean? (laughs) Because some of those houses, just basic houses get that expensive. But it sounds like a lot of the value was the Flintstoniness of it. I think it's also the city. Yeah, they they definitely embraced it, though, if they added more dinosaurs to it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Definitely found the right owner. Yeah. So recently I found another good dinosaur gift, if you're looking. It's a Calamity Ware Gangs All Here Porcelain Dinosaur Platter. And the platter is blue and white. It looks kind of like, you know, fine china kind of style. And it shows dinosaurs going amok. In the picture, there's a number of sauropods and hadrosaurs roaming around buildings and some theropods peeking out here and Hmm. there. And then for some reason, there's a guy in a fishing boat. Anyway, it's currently a Kickstarter project, so see if it becomes more widespread. <laughs> that is a really specific Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. I think that this company does a number of Kickstarter projects for these types of Every time they have a new dish. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> that was hilarious. the gist that I got. <laughs> so it's basically like a pre-order process. Something like that. 
So speaking of gifts, Hasbro has some new toys coming out, including an animatronic broccoli eating dinosaur, which <laughs> somebody tweeted or messaged us that they didn't think that broccoli existed when dinosaurs were around, which is true. But <laughs> Yeah, definitely did. <laughs> but maybe maybe this will help kids want to eat more vegetables. I don't know. That is a popular move. Mm -hmm. Saying like dinosaurs ate their vegetables, you gotta eat your trees or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So it's called a Munch and Rex pet. It's going to cost about $50 when it comes out in the fall, and it's this baby dinosaur, and it hops and begs for attention mm -hmm. when he's hungry or excited. And you can feed him plastic broccoli, or they said caveman cookie treats, but I didn't see a picture of what that looks like. Maybe just chocolate chip cookies. And he can slurp and burp, and he responds to sound and touch. If they're mixing in cavemen with the dinosaurs, we're clearly not going for scientific accuracy. Well, so we already weren't is, with the broccoli, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like broccoli is closer. <laughs> yeah, true. There's another toy that, I'm not sure if it already came out or it's coming out later this year, but it's uh, Nurtram's Egg. Kids can hatch dinosaurs from these, and with these eggs, you can hatch and grow, expand, and morph your toy. <laughs> so you put the egg in fresh water, and you watch it hatch over a few days. And then the toy grows for up to two weeks. It keeps growing. Or you can take it out of water, and it'll shrink back. Who wants it to shrink again? So that you can redo it? I don't know. Oh, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Or maybe you got to move. You got to pack up your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's convenient. It's a feature. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's true because once they grow up or once they expand. Yeah, what are you going to do with it? Yeah, and they're always like mushy and kind of weird. Mm -hmm. But if you could shrink it down and make it grow again, that would probably make it more fun. <laughs> so next we've got a new game that AV Club actually just reviewed called Monster Hunter World. And it sounds like the main point is to fight and stab dinosaurs and other creatures and you use their bones to build new stuff. Mm -hmm. And based on that, it didn't sound that great to me, though the review says the game is visually stunning. But our friend Gabe at Paleo Paradox on Instagram just posted a picture asking if anyone else was playing this game. Uh, and he's been playing it as a break between his writing sessions. And he says he can't get enough of the game but it's because the monsters, quote-unquote monsters in the game, are based off of real-world animals and then reimagined to fit ecologically into the world of Monster Hunter. And he says it's simplified, but creators of this game try to create a living ecosystem that we as hunters are tasked with studying. So he's really excited about it. <laughs> cool. And one of his examples is Kestodon, which is based off a of pachycephalosaur. And also he said, fun fact, if you look at the etymology of the Kestodon genus name, it means box tooth. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, it sounds like they really put a lot of effort into it. They did, so that makes me more likely to play this game now. For sure. Is that a PC game kind of thing? Looks like it's only out on PlayStation 4. Oh, no. They also list, well, at least their hashtags have Xbox One, Xbox, Nintendo, Nintendo Switch. Microsoft Windows. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Cool. We might have to play it. <laughs> and last in the news in New Zealand, there's one... One newlywed couple who photoshopped their wedding photos to include dinosaurs. And the groom said he got the idea after the wedding. Some of them have other fantasy elements like lightsabers, but he's got a few dinosaur ones. There's one with a T-Rex in the background while the couple kiss. There's one with sauropods roaming in the background while the couple sit in a field and look off into the distance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then there's one with a giant T-Rex legs in the photo that show the bridesmaids running, presumably away from the T-Rex. And there's also one with the Velociraptor in the background of a photo that shows the bride getting ready. Mm. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. If you can't get a real dinosaur at your wedding, then that's the way to go. Yeah. Or at least a... A guy in an animatronic suit. Yeah. Like we had. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you can't get a Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get into our other segments, we want to... Give a quick shout out. We're doing a Valentine's Day promotion. So from now until February 14th, Valentine's Day, as a thank you to our current patrons, if you are a patron, we will send you a special audio piece of premium content, which will be all of the love stories <laughs> <laughs> from our Top 10 Dinosaur series. And I say love like that because some of them are not necessarily that affectionate. but <laughs> Most of them involve mating. <laughs> <laughs> but in the animal kingdom, that's not always loving. <laughs> well, I don't know if dinosaurs had a real concept of love anyway. Yeah. But 
<laughs> as close as we could get to it. And if you are not yet a patron, if you join any of our tiers, uh, any of them between now and February 14th, Valentine's Day, then you will also get that special audio premium content. So you have uh, less than two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Please sign up at patreon.com slash I know Dino. And this week we also have a listener question. This one came to us from Keegan and he asked, feathered theropods are often depicted with their forearms, hands, hanging down in front of their knees instead of folded back against their body as modern birds do. This always has looked awkward and inefficient for running. Is there any evidence to suggest that they couldn't fold their forelimbs against their body or tuck their hand claws under their chest, kind of like lightly hugging themselves, or evidence that they did let them hang below them? Are there any modern bipedal species comparisons that let their forelimbs wings hang down like this often? So we forwarded this question to Scott Persons, who is a biomechanics dinosaur expert. Yes, thank you, Scott. And he gave us a great answer. He said, first, some feathered theropods could absolutely fold their arms against their body and give themselves a little hug. And then he attached a photo of Mei Long, also known as the sleeping dragon, that it was kind of in a resting position and it's a troodontid, which is exactly the way that Keegan was asking if they could fold their arms. And he said, now what the arm position was like when walking or running is a more difficult question. Birds mostly tuck their wings out of the way, although it has been suggested that ostriches use their wings to help decelerate or turn. On the other hand, kangaroos don't bother tucking their arms. Instead, roos hold them in a position similar to what I think your listener has seen in dinosaur art. In a chase, the arms of most feather theropods were potentially weapons that might need to be deployed. So if I had to guess, I'd say raptors and lots of other feathered theropods probably kept their arms in front of them and ready for action. So there you go. They probably could tuck their wings out of the way if they're trying to run really fast or something they might have been able to use their wings kind of as a pivot for turning i think that's the coolest thing that they talk about with ostriches mm -hmm. it's like an air brake on a performance ferrari or something <laughs> <laughs> although i don't even think ferraris do that i think they only break generally they don't break just on one side but anyway that ability is awesome and then if you're about to attack something, you might want to keep your arms out in front of you anyway, even though it might slow you down a little bit. It might be worth it in order to have the weapons available for your attacking. So all of the above. <laughs> just, <Nice. laughs> just depends what the dinosaur is trying to do at the moment. <laughs> thanks for the question, Keegan. And thanks again, Scott, for the answer. Yeah. And before we get into our interview... Keegan, who sent the listener question, also happens to be the owner of TRX Dinosaurs which is our sponsor for today's episode. And they, again, make to order dinosaur sculptures and technically probably other prehistoric creatures if you're interested in something else. They say they like to work with extinct animals, but they are a little bit flexible. And they can be posable sculptures with the wire frame inside them so you can put them into different positions and update them in displays when you want to. Or you can get a puppet, which is probably my favorite because I just love a good puppet. And they've also started making dinosaur animatronics if you're looking for something a little more unique. And on the TRX Dinosaurs Instagram, they just posted a really cool update saying that because they sculpt all their dinosaurs out of foam, they end up with a fair amount of excess waste foam, just little pieces that you can't really use for anything else. So they've started putting them into animal beds for homeless and shelter animals. Yeah, and the latest picture as of this recording <laughs> shows a cat by all the foam and then a dinosaur kind of peeking in from outside. <laughs> yeah, this is a pretty great picture. And this is a good example of some of the different types of posts that TRX Dinosaurs does on Instagram where they show how they care about the community and they're often embarking on little projects like this. Yeah. Yeah, they're very good about giving back. So if you're interested in getting your own dinosaur sculpture or animatronic or a puppet, head over to trxdinosaurs.com. And check out their Instagram for any ongoing projects at TRX Dinosaurs. And now for our interview with Dr. Alex Hastings. 
Here today, we are with Dr. Alex Hastings, who's the Assistant Curator of Paleontology at the Virginia Museum of Natural History, and his research interests include the evolutionary relationship between temperature and body size in ectothermic animals, factors that influence turnover and extinction in fossil predators, and evolutionary adaptations to new environments. And we got to meet him at SVP this year, and he has he had this amazing poster about dinosaurs and comic books, which is one of the things we want to talk about. <laughs> So just diving into your poster, from what I remember, it said you looked at 151 comic book issues that were published between 1964 and 2017 by 18 different publication companies, and then you studied them for scientific accuracy. So I guess my first question is, what inspired you to do this study? Honestly, it it came down to uh, uh, been a a comic book reader for basically my entire life, and uh, you know, always kind of drawn to to any issues that had uh, dinosaurs or other kind of ancient creatures. So I had kind of been reading these for a long time. And uh, like a lot of uh, paleontologists, when you see kind of them showing up in popular fiction, you're like, ah, I didn't get this, I didn't get this. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I started thinking about kind of the, the larger context of it and kind of with the growing popularity of the comic book medium, how it could be um, kind of a potential sort of informal education kind of tool. And uh, one of the things I was, I was wanted to look at was uh, how useful they would be for that, considering that, um, you know, there are issues that do come up time and again. So what I was trying to do with this study was to kind of put some numbers on these um, so we can say, OK, this is, these are the, you know, top 10 most common issues. So that way we can make sure people that might want to use these in lessons are aware of um, what those common things are. And you can kind of use that as a uh, discussion point where you can talk about kind of what are the science behind these things and then kind of use that moving forward in um, uh, however you're, you're designing the lesson. But it's been a way of integrating scientific research as well as kind of art and popular fiction. And uh, it's been kind of a fun thing to explore. Very cool. So what were some of the top issues you found? So not surprising. Um, <laughs> size was definitely a major factor. <laughs> um, uh, there are a lot of times when uh, when dinosaurs and other ancient creatures are, are ridiculously oversized. Um, yeah. Like in the poster, I put uh, a pteranodon, which is, you know, not that much bigger than, you know, maybe an, an eagle, maybe a little bit bigger, um, having bitten apart a, a, an airplane. And like, that's just... <laughs> Utterly impossible. But um, other common ones, uh, teeth are actually pretty different in a lot of uh, dinosaurs. So like the front teeth aren't the same as the back teeth or the middle teeth. Um, And very often they're just kind of like a zigzag line, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And one thing that was really common as well and kind of enlightening to a lot of the, the paleontologists I was talking to at the meeting is theropod wrists. So the wrists of a theropod dinosaurs were not actually able to fully pronate. So that's like when you turn your hands so that your palms are facing downward. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, something humans can do and a lot of other animals, but uh, theropods actually would have been bending their wrists in a a different way that would have been much more bird-like. However, that doesn't change the fact that almost every time the theropods came up, they, they had this impossible wrist rotation. And it's, it's unknown enough that uh, there were, several paleontologists that when I was talking about the poster, like, oh, I I really, I didn't know that. (laughs) Yeah. It's a learning experience for a lot of people. Most of the things you pointed out in your poster, like once I read them, it's like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But then I just didn't notice. Yeah. We (laughs) we learned about the pronating thing definitely after we started the podcast, Mm -hmm. especially with Mm -hmm. T-Rex. I always seen it. I always see it with like its claws pointed forward kind of thing like it's gonna you know grab onto something downward right. yeah but, but but even like you were saying with the teeth looking all the same like oh, it yeah. didn't, i didn't notice at all until actually your poster and now i notice <laughs> now you can't not <laughs> <laughs> i know you've noticed yeah. it sometimes with sauropods because when sauropods have like those jagged sharp looking zigzag of teeth oh, yeah. it's pretty obvious yeah. <laughs> what's uh yeah it's funny when you see like a, a definite herbivore with like sharp pointy teeth <laughs> like there's definitely a Parasaurolophus, which is not a carnivorous kind of looking dinosaur. Um, mm-hmm. And one comic had these big, long, fang-like teeth. I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, 
Lots of vampires. Uh, and another pretty simple thing but showed up a lot is just the number of digits on the hands and feet. Mm-hmm. So even though I feel like uh, a lot of people do know that T-Rexes have basically two fingers, um, there's still plenty of times when uh, not only will I have three fingers, but uh, I showed one in the poster where I had like three fingers and a thumb. Uh, <laughs> way beyond anything they had that's funny i don't think any dinosaurs had thumbs did they like they almost always had no digit one right not not like a human thumb for sure yeah Yeah. or maybe did carnotaurus there were a couple that had five digits but most of them had what two to four i would say yeah and a lot of them were three Yeah. yeah so i think your poster said something about having a rubric what kind of criteria were you looking for going through all these comics um, so I was looking for not only the, the morphological aspects, so like what I was just talking about with the, the wrists and, and size and stuff like that, but um, I also wanted to evaluate temporal mixing sets, so kind of things from different time periods together, as well as kind of just um, even having like dinosaurs in modern times, uh, whether or not that's explained in the story. So if that's explained in the story, then that's one thing, but if it's just kind of they're there and it, you never really... <laughs> Sure, what's going on with that? Um, and that was a very common issue as well. As actually, um, from the sample, is eighty percent of the issues did not explain um, <laughs> mixing of things. Um, really? You think they just yeah. felt like drawing yeah. dinosaurs that day? <laughs> I yeah, yeah. And that was you know really across all all time from the nineteen sixties through present day. Um, a lot of things that would happen is sometimes they would explain like why a human was there, but then they wouldn't explain why like a a stegosaurus from the Jurassic is with a T-Rex from the Cretaceous kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Or the the very common having Ice Age animals with dinosaurs and other kind of Jurassic era animals. So like in the poster, I had a saber-toothed cat fighting a pterodactyl um, (laughs) that was uh, also set in 1981. So kind of issues there. That's ridiculous. That's surprising to me that they spend so little time explaining that. Because to me, if you have a story and you end up with a human encountering a dinosaur, a main piece of that story would be how that happened. It's weird to glaze over that. Honestly, what I was expecting going into, I didn't think it was going to be quite so common. So it's a good kind of issue to highlight if you are trying to to use these for informal education, then you want to be aware of that. that, uh, you can let people know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So did most of the comics take place in the present day with dinosaurs around or was, was it more like time travel stuff? There was actually a lot more that brought them to our time hmm. than, you know, people or, or other kind of modern things going back in time. There's also, uh, I'd say a, the most common scenario is just kind of like this mystic land somewhere that somehow these things are, are still there. Hmm all that time and the the kinds of cases where you have like a time portal or something are uh, are definitely less common gotcha so like the lost world sort of scenario exactly were there any that didn't have people that were like just dinosaurs that was another thing that uh, was not as common there are a few out there that um, did keep it to non-human scenarios so uh, age of reptiles is a comic that's um, kind of been revived a few times and that is is set entirely in whatever time period they chose. And that one is well-researched. That is, has kind of everything from an environment that existed together and actually has, has no people and as a result has actually no dialogue either. Hmm. But there are just a, a few cases like that. Um, there's always either a human or a very anthropomorphic kind of scenario. So like I <laughs> threw in a couple of uh, fun kids once. I had like Muppet Babies. You've got like little Kermit and stuff. So I guess technically those those would be non-humans, but they're they're humanish. <laughs> <laughs> How did you find these comics? Oh, I I've had them. <laughs> so <laughs> that one in particular goes back to I don't even know. I was probably like three years old, and my parents bought it for me. <laughs> That's great. It is. <laughs> I remember on your poster, too, there was an example of, I forget which kind of dinosaur, with the really bent, stiff tail, and that was kind of a weird thing. Yeah, so that shows up a lot where it's kind of a a generic raptor in quotes. (laughs) So it's, you know, it's definitely a dromaeosaurid, but they don't really ever specify in the story. And that was one of those where it's it's more or less kind of the, the Jurassic Park 
Velociraptor, and it, it's kind of big size, but that one did have this like ridiculous tail bend where it's like a full <laughs> 90 degree angle with the back yeah. um, you know, backwards. So, and then on top of that, you know, missing feathers and um, kind of the wrists and all that. Mm-hmm. He was fighting saber tooth, which is kind of cool. <laughs> I think there was also one, there were no pupils in the eyes. Ugh. Yeah, uh, that was actually also really common. I was not expecting that one either. Um, for some reason, I think people just think they look cool, maybe. <laughs> so they look kind of a little more fierce when there's like no pupils in the eyes and it's just like yellow or something. <laughs> Sometimes they'll even be glowing for some reason because I guess it looks cool. Yeah, they're radioactive or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're about to shoot out laser beams from their eyes or something. <laughs> <laughs> There is a, a fun Spider-Man, and they did at least explain this, but they actually had fire-breathing raptors, uh, which was kind of fun. <laughs> How did they explain that? It was, uh, they had this whole um, villain scenario in the Savage Land where he was modifying the dinosaurs, and they had these kind of weird cyborg rigs on them so that they could do things beyond what they could have <laughs> otherwise done. And that's actually how they explained uh, the Dilophosaurus spitting acid. Huh. So it kind of had a little bit of that explanation for the Jurassic Park scenario. Right. So it had like a flamethrower built into it? In the raptor. They had like this, yeah, like flamethrower thing rigged up around their necks that they could open their mouths and just all this fire would come out. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) That's pretty cool. (laughs) Were there any that stood out as particularly scientifically accurate? Yeah, so... um, there are a few kind of companies or artists that um, are clearly like really into um, what they're working on. So I'll go ahead and, and give a shout out to uh, Brett Booth, who is an artist uh, currently for DC Comics. You can tell he's he just really likes it a lot. Um, so he tends to put a lot of time and effort into getting the anatomy right and kind of keeping up to the science. So if they, you know, as of when he was drawing them, feathers are, are believed to be part of the group. He'll have feathers, um, the wrists are... Uh, correct, that sort of thing. The Age of Reptiles that I mentioned before is another one where um, they spend quite a bit of time getting all the, the stuff accurate, at least for the time. Uh, some of these are, are several years old now, so they're not up to the current standards, but they were for their time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, you know, a handful of others, but, uh, uh, you know, these recurring problems are recurring because a lot of artists and, and companies aren't maybe aware of the issues or don't have the time that maybe they would like to to fully research everything. Makes sense. So you were mentioning looking at these comic books and this study could be used for educational purposes. Yeah, a lot of time. Yeah. And you've been working on an after-school program with this, right? Here in uh, Virginia, we've got this, or at least specifically in our area, this program called Martinsville Henry County After Three. And this is a program where uh, basically... Kids go to these kind of local schools and community centers to uh, hang out after school until their parents can come get them after work. And um, the museum has been doing programs with them for a while now where um, they come in and kind of do pretty informal lessons that have some kind of recurring theme. Um, So what I've been doing uh, with our education department here is uh, running these programs uh, where basically we have eight sessions um, with the same group of kids. And then we kind of started the program over again. And now we're on our third run of that. And uh, so it's been really, really good educational experience for me to kind of understand where the base knowledge is for a lot of this stuff and how interested they are and um, what their desires are to create content as well. So part of the program is also uh, designing, creating their own kind of mini comic books by the end. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) And how's it gone so far? You said you're on your third iteration, so you've got some comic books. Right. So uh, it's gone. Um, it's gone all right. We're, we're still kind of learning and improving the, the system, but it's, uh, it's doing much smoother. It seems to help to kind of give them a little bit of structure and not just kind of let it just make things just here's paper, make it um, to at least kind of be <laughs> like, all right, well, here's paper with panels already on it. OK, mm-hmm. maybe if you start with something like this or, you know, if you like dogs, you can work dogs into the story, that sort of thing. Cool. And how interested are they in being accurate? Or is it more about the art and just creating something? It's, I think for especially for middle schoolers, I'm I'm definitely not being hypercritical. <laughs> um, so I definitely talk about these common things, and um, they can they're definitely retaining a lot of that, and they're working that into their drawing. But they they are fairly kind of simplistic drawings, which is totally fine and cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're 
kind of focusing more on the basics and not worrying about the the fine details so much. But I think part of the the larger goal of it is to kind of create a, a an awareness and hopefully an, an appreciation for dinosaurs in the ancient world. And I'm hoping I think that we are hitting that goal. Cool. Are you going to have more of these programs after this third time around? Uh, we have one more. Um, so basically, it's uh, running this whole semester. And then um, I think we're going to try and see if we can kind of repurpose it in, in other ways as well um, to run them in different styles of programs. Mm-hmm. Very cool. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not that familiar with the Virginia Museum of Natural History. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about what, what people might find there? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, we're kind of a little off the beaten path. Um, so we are in Martinsville, Virginia, which is in southern, kind of southwestern Virginia. Um, so we are actually close to the North Carolina border. Mm-hmm. So if any listeners know where Roanoke is, basically go straight south from there. We've actually got a decent strength for uh, dinosaurs in our exhibits. So like we've got uh, full-size Allosaurus, Acrocanthosaurus, Stegosaurus and Triceratops skeletons in our exhibits, um, as well as a whole host of bones and displays of different kinds. We have our, our main hall of ancient life, which features not only dinosaurs, but also we've got some ice age and a big whale skeleton. And uh, in July, uh, timed with our dinosaur festival, we opened a new exhibit there. So we got a lot of fun stuff, including the only real good evidence for a live interaction between a T-Rex and a Triceratops. What? <laughs> yeah, so we got bite marks in a Triceratops from a T-Rex, but more importantly, there's healing in the bones. So that means it was a live interaction and not a scavenging. Wow, that's nice. cool. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> so uh, what's your focus in the museum? So as a curator, um, a large part of my job is research, but it's also um, outreach and this sort of informal education kind of thing. So my areas of research uh, leading into the job were um, really focused on fossil reptiles for the most part. But uh, since coming here, I've been really trying to branch out and and take advantage of the strengths of the collections here. Um, And what we have a lot of are uh, fossil sharks, fossil whales, uh, even fossil insects, um, mastodons have been <laughs> kind of really uh, forcing myself to to learn quite a lot of not forcing, um, <laughs> enjoying getting to to learn a lot of different aspects of uh, of paleontology. So really learning a lot more about kind of the variety of ancient life, which has been a really fun and rewarding experience. Cool. So I have to ask: Are there any plans to uh, put some sort of comic book exhibit together now that you've? I would absolutely love to. Um, so we just finished this exhibit in July, and we're hoping to to have that one up for a while. So um, <laughs> it's probably going to be a little while before we do a whole new exhibit. But uh, I'm definitely highly interested in that. Um, we'll have to do a little bit of kind of research into copyright and that sort of thing. But uh, uh, yeah. no, I'm definitely, definitely interested in um, having a, a physical exhibit that people can come and check this stuff out. <laughs> yeah, that would be. I think that'd be great for public knowledge. I've never seen that kind of thing in a museum before, so that would be neat. There's a yeah. There's I've seen just a handful of kind of comic exhibits, and they've been kind of much more art focused. And I haven't really seen one that was science focused. If if it is out there, I definitely would like to know about it. But um, in any case, I I think it would be a fun thing for people to come and see. Definitely, cool. So where is the best place if people wanted to find out more about your work or the Virginia Museum of Natural History? So we do uh, maintain a blog. uh, So that is at paleolab.org, paleolab.org, where we'll put up a lot of this stuff. So I do have a post on the uh, dinosaurs and comic books. There's also, of course, our uh, museum's Facebook page, which I do a lot of stuff for that as well. And then uh, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dr. Crocogator. That's at... D-R underscore C-R-O-C-O-G-A-T-O-R. That's a great name. <laughs> that sounds like a villain in a comic book. <laughs> in a comic book, yeah. <laughs> the evil Dr. Crocogator. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I need to make that comic. That sounds amazing. Definitely. <laughs> and then put it in the museum. There you yeah. go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much for chatting with us today. It was really, of course. yeah, that was a lot of fun. And yeah, it's it's such a different 
like you're saying, this kind of stuff, it's usually focused on art, and it's really cool to see it from a scientific point of view. Yeah. I think there's, there's definitely room to blend these two together. So it's very much a, not only a STEM project, but a STEAM project, mm-hmm. incorporating art, science, and kind of pop fiction all together. Definitely. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for joining. Sure. No problem. Thanks again, Alex. Looking at dinosaurs through the lens of comic books, it's a really interesting way of looking at paleontology and science. (laughs) Yeah, and it's a good way to interact with kids and the community in general. Mm -hmm. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Xenotarsosaurus, which was a request from Kusari Gamer via YouTube. So thanks. It was an abelosaurid that lived in the Cretaceous in what is now Argentina, and its name means strange Tarsus lizard. Juan Carlos Sciuto found theropod remains at a fossil site in Chubut province in 1980, and later Jose Fernando Bonaparte and a team found more theropod bones, potentially from the same individual. And then it was described in 1986 by Ricardo Martinez, Olga Jimenez, Jorge Rodriguez, and Graciela Botete. There's only one species, Xenotarsosaurus bonapartei, And the species name, as you may guess, is in honor of Jose Bonaparte. The only known fossils so far are of a right hind limb, dorsal vertebrae, femur, tibia, fibula, and part of the ankle. That's not so bad. No, that's true. (laughs) And they had a complete fusion between two of the bones of the ankle, which is unusual for a theropod and is what led to its name, strange tarsus lizard. It's estimated to be about 18 feet or 5.4 meters long, and it had some similarities to Carnotaurus sastrei, so scientists assigned it to a Belosauridae, though some think that it's actually an indeterminate Neoceratosaurian theropod. It was probably one of the main predators of its area, and it may have preyed on Cicerosaurus, which was a hadrosaurid, and even Drusillosaur, which was a titanosaur. And our fun fact of the day comes from a discussion I had on the dinosaur subreddit where someone was asking whether T-Rex would even bother to eat people or if we were so small that T-Rex would just skip over us and focus on larger prey. Don't move and it won't notice you. Yeah. Looking a little bit into T-Rex and whether or not we were too small to be eaten. First of all, T-Rex is a little bit different than what we think of with modern say, mammals for hunting, because dinosaurs tend to fill different niches as they grow up. So even if an adult T-Rex wasn't going to eat you, there's a pretty good chance that a juvenile T-Rex, you would be like a really big feast for. (laughs) So even if you're not running away from big T-Rex, there's likely to be a smaller T-Rex that might want to eat you. On top of that, Humans actually aren't that much smaller than a T-Rex in terms of meal size. So we're about 1% of the weight of a T-Rex, which is quite a bit smaller, 1 one hundredth of the size. But if you think about a meal that you eat, if you're 150 pounds, you don't generally eat 150 pounds of food. (laughs) You'll eat, say, a 24-ounce steak. And a 24-ounce steak to a 150-pound person is about the same as a human to a T-Rex. So... There you go. It's probably still a pretty decent meal. And I also realize that we have a lot more bones in us than a steak does. But even if you cut that in half or whatever, you know, it's still a lot of food. And on top of that, T-Rex, way more than any other type of dinosaur, has the ability to digest bone, essentially. It can crush right through it with its teeth. And, you know, they, they're osteophages. <laughs> they can basically consume bone. So... I think that we would definitely have to worry about T-Rex if we were around at the same time as it, because we'd just be these little walking hamburgers to them. (laughs) But raw. Yeah, that's the way they like it. (laughs) (laughs) And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to subscribe to us so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And also, don't forget, from now until Valentine's Day, February 14th, sign up to be a patron and we'll give you a special audio premium content of our dinosaur love stories. <laughs> so check out our page at patreon.com slash I Thanks again and until next time. 
Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at I Know Dino.